Thank you for joining us here on the Frank Sontag Podcast. We are up every Friday on all the usual places, primarily YouTube. And I am blessed to be in this chair to interview people from all walks of life. My guest in studio is a man that I've known for a handful of time. It's been a few years. And in my background of rock and roll being at KLOS for 27 years, I heard a little bit about my guest, who I'll name in a moment. And then fast forward to more recent time, I've seen him at my church. And he is uh, someone that knows a lot about music, a lot about uh, the Lord, And so I cornered him a few weeks ago. He's a busy guy. And I said, Tony, I really want you to come on my podcast. And he said, just tell me when. So without further introducing, I'd like to welcome to the Frank Sontag podcast, Tony Pia. Thank you. Wow, man, you made me feel important. You know, jeez. (laughs) I'm actually somebody. Yeah, you, you are somebody. Now, in terms of our listeners, our viewers that may or may not know you, um, I don't want to put you in a, a box or a category, but among many things that you do, I think you would be identified as a drummer. Right. Right. Why a drummer? And I know you've toured with some people that I know back from the KLOS days. We'll talk a little bit about that. But how did drumming enter Tony Pia's life? Is that something you always wanted to do? And by the way, on the way over here, I'm not going to talk much more. It's primarily you. But I started thinking... And I didn't even know this. Tony Pia, you've always struck me as Italian, because I'm Italian. Yes. Are you Italian? I am. Did somebody come over from the old country and change their last name? No. But my both my mom and dad came here after World War II. Really? Yeah. They were born and raised in Italy. My dad was 21, I think, when he came here. And my mom was, I think, 19 when she came over here. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And they <laughs> – uh, can I tell the story? Absolutely. Okay. We're going to tell a lot of stories today. Okay, great. So, you know, just – my mom passed away four years ago, and she she told – you know, all my life we heard about, you know, what it, what was what was going on in World War II. That was, you know, kind of – it was in all the papers. You probably heard about it. I think yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> so they were there. In Italy during World War II, and wow. they lived under Mussolini and all that. So my mom, <laughs> this German soldier, saved my mom's life because they like she was like I don't know nine years old, standing in the middle of the street in the town that they lived in, and you know an American plane started coming down, you know, shooting up this the street. My mom didn't know anything; she's just standing there, she's a little kid, and this German soldier grabbed her through threw both of them through a window, and it saved her life, you know. But they told me about a lot of things, you know, that, that what it was like. And my mom, just before she passed away, notice I'm going back to my mom. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just before she passed away, she still remembered the song that they had to sing in school. They had a picture of Mussolini on the wall, and they, when they came in, they had to sing this song to Mussolini. And she sang it one day. So this was like you know, 2019, you know, like a year before she passed away. And she was astonished. She, she couldn't believe she even remembered it. And I was like, wow. Sing. And she sang it again, you know. And she, I, she, she told me what it, what it was, what the words were, but I don't, I don't remember. But they, as soon as the war was over, they wanted to get out, yeah. you know. Like the, the Nazis came to my mom's farm and they just said, uh, this is ours now. Get out! And the the soldiers let my mom and her family stay in the barn. You know, and they they confiscated the house and took it. You know, I mean, they were just you know peasants. They you know my my mom's family. They were just like everyone else, an agrarian family. They just farmed. That's what they did. So, but they the Nazis took a liking to my mom. She was a little girl, and they gave her chocolate and stuff like that. You know. Um, you know, she saw things, you know, like, you know, uh, she, she told me the story of the, the kid, this kid that she went to school with that he, that she knew, uh, he had just bought a donkey, you know, she's walking, he's walking the donkey back home and this, not, you know, this German soldier said, give me the, give me the donkey, I need it. And he goes, no, I just bought it. I just, it's mine. I, he just shot him, took the donkey, you know, my mom saw stuff like that, you know. So my dad comes over to Italy 
and they were, you know, they were all poor. You know, I, went, I got to go back there and see where they were raised. And, you know, they, I mean, there was no indoor bathrooms or any of that kind yeah. of thing, you know. Yeah. And my dad, he came over here and he was living with, you know, a guy who was, would become my uncle. And uh, he was looking through his mail and some pictures fell out. And my dad picked up the pictures and he, he said, who's that? And he goes, oh, that's my sister. It was my mom. And so he said, can I, can I write to her? You know, this is like, you know, 19, you know, 49, kind of, you know, uh, they, they had just come over here. And, you know, there's no phone. You can't just pick up a phone and, hey, sure. how are you doing? You know, or text. Was, no. And you, you would write and hopefully, you know, after a couple of weeks, the mail would get there. And, you know, and, um, you know, so my dad started writing to my mom, never met her, proposed to her in the mail. My goodness. Sent, sent her money to come over here. And as it turned out, when she was a little girl, my dad was a little older. When she was a little girl, she used to go into my, my dad's orchard and steal apples, and my dad would chase her, chase her away. You know? they, didn't re they didn't realize it until later. You know? oh my gosh. So he proposed to her and sent her money, and they came over and lived happily ever after. You know? yeah. and I was the firstborn, and then my brother and my sister. And so all of our family was like that. I mean, my uncles, my aunts, they were all there and then came over here. So, yeah, that makes me first-generation American. And, you know, they came over here, and it was a whole, <laughs> a whole different culture yeah. than what they were used to. Yeah. And they had to adapt. They had to learn a new language, all that kind of stuff, you know. And they tried to, you know, knock that into me. You know, you got to learn to speak Italian. I'm like, what? I, you know, I want to... <laughs> I'm at school. No one speaks Italian at school, Mom. And by the way, stop giving me those sandwiches with all the lunch meat and stuff. And just give me peanut butter and jelly because I no one wants those sandwich sandwiches. I want to like trade. That's funny. That's funny. So, you know, it, it was, you know, you just take it for granted. I mean, that's just how it was, and and I had that that influence of. You know, all everyone, my cousins, my aunts and uncles, they were all from the old country. You know, I just wanted to be American. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I didn't know that about you. You probably don't know this about me. So my great-grandfather came over from Italy. Um, growing up, my dad's mom and dad were my nana and papa. Mm -hmm. Spent a lot of time with them. We would play, my sister and I, we would be at their house constantly. We'd play pinochle. <laughs> when uh, they oftentimes argued, they'd go from English and start arguing in Italian. <laughs> yes. So I was raised in that. Mario Lanza was always being played in the house. I mean, I was raised really deep with Italian roots to be proud of Italy. Ironically, I've never been. I went to Europe for the first time last year, but we're from Abruzzi and Naples, Napoli, Don, so all that stuff. So we share somewhat of a similar background. So here's the question I want to ask you. So was music prominent in your house growing up? Oh, man. Well, <laughs> years, years later, I mean, I was in my 20s. I was at a wedding with my mom. I don't know. It was a, one of my cousins got married. And I said, hey, mom, you want to dance? And she goes, oh, I don't know. You know. So I got her to come up and dance. And she just had, like, no rhythm. I mean, it's like, <laughs> mom, what's up, man? <laughs> you know? But my dad, growing up, he was always playing, like, opera around the house, Italian opera. And he would play, like, on Sundays in Detroit, there was a show, like, the Italian show you know it was off a couple hours in the afternoon on sundays and he would play that show and they would play you know all these italian operas and stuff and i i just i would hear that all the time and i to this day i still i can hear something and i and i can i can sing along to it or hum along to it because I, I it was just i just picked it up so you were born in detroit i'm from cleveland so we share kind of that 
that Midwest root, if yeah. you will. Yeah. Um, I was just telling my son last night, we were talking about faith. We'll get into that a little later. And I was telling him on Sundays, everything was closed down. Blue laws. Oh, yeah. People went oh, yeah. to church. It was just assumed. And now here we are 56 years later. Things have changed quite a bit. So being raised in that environment, opera, how did drums kind of come into <laughs> that? You know what? I have. I, I don't really know exactly, but... Um, did you I, want a guitar? Yeah. I did. The very first thing I wanted to play was guitar. I asked my dad for a guitar, but I was like five or six, something like that. So he bought me this ukulele and I just like destroyed it <laughs> like in two weeks. Just, the strings were gone, you know, it was falling apart. Um, and uh, he, so around that time in, in Detroit, I would be in the car with my mom and dad, and we'd be going somewhere. I'd be in the back seat, and my mom, my dad would, he had the music, he had the radio on, like all the time. And I would hear these bands, and the radio station he listened to, it was called CKLW in Detroit. And I think it was actually a, a Windsor, Canada. It was a, a, a station from Windsor, Canada. Mm -hmm. But they played all the pop songs, you know. So I was hearing all these pop songs, and I didn't know... You know, I was like maybe six years old, and I didn't get, you know, what recorded music was. So I heard this music coming from the speakers, and I knew that it was a radio station, and I just assumed that they were there was, playing there. Yeah, there were there were bands sure. playing in there, and there was like sure. a band setting up over here while this one played, and then you know, and I could because I couldn't figure out how how come the snare drum sounds different with that band, but it sounds the different on that. band? Band, you know, I couldn't. I didn't know it was a record. I I didn't know any of that stuff, and it just fascinated me. I just was like, wow, you know, it just and, and just listening to the music was just. I, I liked it. And I couldn't. I was trying to figure out the sounds. Like, why does that sound like that? You know, so that's um, kind of like the musical prep, if you will, mm -hmm. with, with with that stuff. And then I as, as I got older. Like in school, you had to pick an instrument to Correct. play. Correct. You know, that's right. I got stuck with the accordion for whatever that's. Oh, for. I didn't. I I think they tried to get me to do that, and I was like, "There's no way. Yeah, there's no way." And I think the the big influence for me was the Beatles. When when I would hear their recordings, I just knew I want. I was just mesmerized by that. Yeah, you know, and I wanted to like pursue that. And again, I asked my dad for a guitar, but when we went to the school, it was like, no, we don't have guitars. You can play trombone, saxophone, clarinet, you know, flute or or percussion. I'm like, percussion, right here, right here. You know? <laughs> so I I I that's I, you know, if they had a guitar, I might have wound up playing guitar, but yeah. I, you know, I don't know. Tony P is my guest. So drums, when you started, was it like, oh man. Did you have a sense like this is going to be something that you would be walking with for a long time, or was it just kind of easing as you go and see what happens? No, it was like I was consumed with it because I mean I thought about it all the time, and my my friends they they were playing guitars and they would invite me to play with them, but I didn't have a a drum or anything. But somebody would have a drum set there. <clears throat> my buddy of mine, Dale, he was in. In, in percussion in band class with us and he had a drum set his dad was a drummer so he had this little remo red sparkle drum set and i couldn't play it i never had any lessons or anything but he could play a little bit and so i i would like go over his house and he'd let me mess around a little bit and then when, when i played with my friends i had like a I, I eventually got a snare drum and i had like a box that the snare drum went in like a case for it and i used to bang on that with one stick and hit like something else with my other hand you know to make it kind of sound like it was a beat or something you know and that's how how it kind of kind of started and then my dad got me um a drum set and that was like that was my christmas gift you know was this drum set and i then I, it just took off i i wanted lessons and i got i started getting good at it and you know it was just, i was just consumed with it and by by the time i was in the eighth grade i knew i thought you know i think i want to do this like all the time but i'm going to wait another year till the ninth grade to, to make a decision and when i got to the ninth grade i said this is it i'm 
I'm doing this or I'm going to do this for my life. So did you get, I'm sure you had teachers and people of influence, did you get the proverbial, hey, Tony, that's good, but, you know, to do this, if you will, as a career, not that you were necessarily career-minded in the ninth grade, but you got a lot of naysayers going, just enjoy it now, and maybe there was a part of you that thought, no, I think this is going to be a large part of my life. Well, oddly enough, yes. And it mostly came from my parents, you know, because they were, yeah, yeah, that's really good. You're doing good. But, you know, you're going to get old enough and you want to, like, have a family. And, you know, my dad worked for Ford Motor Company oh, for my gosh. 42 years. My, my grandfather worked for Fisher Body. Okay. Yeah, my, I had another uncle. He worked for Chrysler and another uncle that worked for Fisher Body. And it's like, you know, you're... You know, I grew up in Detroit. It's yeah. Motown, the Motor City. So, I mean, it's kind of like that's what they're known for. So that's what, you know, they, they had jobs doing that. And, you know, my dad was constantly trying to get me, you know, I, I can get you a job at Ford. If, you know, it, it pays pretty good. It's union and, you know, you'll do you'll do really good. You'll make some money, you know. He was constantly trying to get get me to do that. He got my brother in there for a while, but then my brother didn't last long there because because my brother was also a musician. He played saxophone and piano, and he was trying to do both at the same time. And he was burning himself out, so he just like quit at four. But um, yeah, it was it was it, it's it's a blue at the time it was a blue collar town, and so music was like just something people did just you know for on the weekends and stuff, and I was taking it like pretty seriously, you know, and that was one of the things that made me leave is because I knew I got no future here in Detroit. Yeah. I, you know, it's like, this is it. I, you know, I'm like 20 years old and like, it's not going to get any better than this. You got to get out of here. So before you leave Detroit, the question I had, I don't know the answer. You mentioned the word Motown. Yeah. I mean, you talk about the epicenter for music, man, Detroit was it for Motown uh, influences, was there a particular uh, genre of music that you were drawn to, rock, soul, opera? Did you just kind of jump in with hands all I every just, which way? I just jumped in because it, it was such an extraordinary time, you know, it, and it wasn't just the rock and roll thing. Everything was going on at, at, at the same time. I mean, there was, there was a jazz community. There was the rock and roll thing. You know, there, I just jumped in. Anything that had to do with music, if I could get involved with it, I mean, I sang in the choir at school because it's music, and, and I, I played in the band at school. I played in, in symphony band. I got a scholarship to Interlochen, and that's like the symphony orchestra. Uh, I did stage band after school because they didn't even do that. It wasn't like legit back then. It was You had to do it like as a side thing. I was playing with my buddies. I played weddings, you know, uh, Polish weddings, German weddings, Italian weddings, it, you know, anything that was related to music, I just wanted to get in it mm. and, and, and do it. And, and Detroit at that time was just such an amazing place because there were some great musicians that came out of Detroit, not, to, not just Motown itself. I mean, that, you know, a typical thing at that time was, you know, I, I could drive down with the, down the street with my cousins and he'd have like he'd have cklw on and some you know stevie wonder would be playing all the motown stuff and and then i you know the next day i'm at school and i'm playing in band and orchestra class and then i'm playing with my buddies we had a band called total destruction in seventh grade <laughs> right and um you know we played all that we played like you know the turtle songs and you know Van, you know van morrison gloria louis louis and we did all that all that stuff too so it was just like anything that that i could get get into and then you know the cool thing about radio at that time you just turn it on and it was like oh it's steely dan oh, oh turn the station oh there's you know there's a new beatles song you know here's here's you know turn the station and oh that's you know Cre credence clearwater here's, here's grand funk you know bob seger you know i'm from detroit and it was just like it was such a mecca of like cultural activity yeah it was just like thriving anything anything that like you could think of that like i wonder what this is like and you is like you could check it out so 
in a way, we'll get to God in a little while, but in a way, I know for those of us of faith, we look back and may we not have intentionally or consciously walk with God, but you look back, you go, oh man, his, his thumbprints are everywhere. So in terms of music, as you share that, it's like, it's kind of undeniable. I'm not a guy that believes in coincidence. Mm -hmm. So all that being said, you made mention of, so you hit twenties, Detroit's kind of, uh, maybe it's time to hit the road. So where did you go? Did you come out here? Mm -hmm. Did something break in the industry? I mean, tell me more about, okay, the twenties and Tony Pia, where, you went from doing all of these roads with the drums, and now you're kind of venturing out into the, the entertainment industry in a major sort of way. So my brother and I, we wanted to go to New York. So we went to New York and tried to make a go of it, and it was just, it was brutal. You know, I mean, I, I realized, I discovered really quick to live in New York City, you, you know, which we had an apartment on 104th between Broadway and Ans Amsterdam. And we wanted to do music because we just, at the time, we were both really into the jazz thing. And, the, you know, it, it doesn't get any more jazz than being in New York. But, you know, you quickly quickly realize that you have to have a lot of capital to, to live in a city like New York. You got to have a lot of money to, to live there. And as a drummer, man, I need a place to play. And like everyone, you know, it's it's... It was a rat race. I mean, it was just like there's nowhere where you can play your drums and have a car. And, you know, it was just yeah. it, you have to be pretty well off to live there, especially in M Manhattan. So so that lasted several months and we went back to Detroit. But what happened was what got me out of Detroit was I, I got a gig in Vegas with a, a singer named Bob Anderson <clears throat> who's who's still out there. He does, he does an incredible Frank Sinatra impersonation. Actually, he's going to be in town, I think, next month. Um, and he had a gig in Vegas at the top of the dunes in Vegas. It's not there anymore, but um, six nights a week. Wow. So it's like, yeah, I'm there. Let's go. You know, and we went there and I played Vegas. We did, we did two dinner sets and two shows six nights a week at, in, Ve in Vegas at the top of the dunes. And that was... Where I got that was where uh, I I got saved was was in Vegas of all places of all places yeah <laughs> what what uh, what era are we talking about what so this would have been like 1978 okay something like that yeah around there I I I went there in January of 77 so yeah I probably got saved in it was I think it was. April of 78. So I want to really get deeper into the whole music and hmm. uh, where you've toured with and, and all that stuff. But since you just opened this one up, I, I would not have seen this one coming. <laughs> so you go in the 70s, you try New York, doesn't work, go back to Detroit, and then you hear about this gig at the Dunes. You go to Vegas six days, six nights a week, going, going, going. Of all places, how, how Vegas <laughs> that you would get saved? Because, you know, we still call right, it Sin right. City and the right. whole thing. And right. So what happened? Did you have faith growing up at all? I would imagine. So when I was a kid, I actually, you know, I was like six, seven years old. I actually wanted to be an altar boy. Well, I knew it. And, and yeah. Not only, not just that, though, I wanted to be a priest. I, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, right. knew it. <laughs> right? We all kind of, me too, at one time. Yeah, it's, it's the Italian. Yeah, that's right. The Italian upbringing. But what happened for me was that church, it, it just became, it was, a, I mean, I didn't know at the time, but it was a ritual. I mean, it wasn't like, I didn't connect with it. The, my favorite part about the mass was, was the, the homily or the, the, um, Yep. The, the message, yep. the preaching, you know, because it was out of scripture. That was it. I mean, that was like the every mass, like that was the high point after that, everything sucked, you know, for me, you know. And so I started to kind of like drift from God, you know, but but I know what you, it sounds weird, but that was where I found God was in Sin City, which you would think like, what? You know? or, or he found you. What happened? Yeah, he definitely. Uh, <laughs> So, um, I, I got I, I became Christian, got accepted the Lord, got baptized at a Baptist church 
Okay. You know, I don't even, I can't even remember what, what it was. It was just a small Baptist church. I got baptized there. And, um, um, it, it was, it was a time of like, for me, it was just like a lot of things were happening then. I kind of didn't understand it. And I had a neighbor. I was living in an apartment complex, the Warren, Warren Chateau, I think it was called, or Warren Apartment Complex, and I'm from Warren, so it was kind of weird. I was living in an apartment, and two doors down was this guy named Mike O'Connor, Michael O'Connor, and he was a believer, and we kind of, he was like a tennis pro and like, you know, a businessman, you know, but we were like, he was like maybe a couple years older than me, you know, but... We kind of struck up a friendship, and uh, he started talking to me, you know. And he was, he, <laughs> he was saying, he was telling me about some guy that he was working with that was that was Muslim, and he would he would mock him, you know. He'd like, yeah, 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 you're, you know, yeah, yeah, Allah, yeah, he's, there's no Allah, you know. He'd like, I'm like looking at this guy, like, well, why are you like talking to me about this stuff? And then he kept talking to me. He just kind of kept talking about the Lord. And it was weird to me because I was Catholic. And he would be talking to me like on a Tuesday night or, you know, a Thursday afternoon after work about, about God. And I'm like, man, like, I, I'm Catholic. We don't talk about God on Sundays. For sure. Like, why are you like talking? And he just kept talking to me. And, and I was just in a bad way. I, I, I was, you know, going through a lot of weird things. And, um, and he gave me a Bible, which I still have an NIV and he signed it and he he started he just kept talking to me and there was a I don't know anymore but there was a great Christian radio show in Vegas and I used to listen to it all the time and I got exposed to uh Chuck Smith, you know, Chuck Chuck Smith Chuck Smith senior uh John MacArthur um Vernon, J. Vernon McGee, oh, yeah. through the Bible. That's right. Um, who else was that? I can't remember, but I was on. I had the radio on all the time, listening to those guys, and they had a really good Christian, like uh, uh, music program. Um, and I, I got, I, I heard about Amy Grant and Phil Keggy and all the different people, you know, that that were like Christian, Christian artists, but they used to play with like secular bands, and they. But then they became Christians, and, and I just started listening to that stuff. And my friend kept talking, talking to me, and it just God kind of made sense all of a sudden to me. And it, 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 he broke through all the chaos. Yeah. And I kept hearing this voice saying, "I'm the author of life." Oh wow! I just kept hearing it like all the time, like I'm the author of life, and it just. It just got to me, yeah. You know, it just got to me, and and I I knew, I kind of knew I, I I knew I'm a I'm a Christian. I gotta like accept the Lord, you know. And I did it, and it, you know it it changed my life. Everything, um, everything kind of like started making sense. And I left Vegas and I went back to Detroit. And um, I was at church, and I heard this girl talking about Bible college. And I went, you go to Bible college? And she goes, yeah, tomorrow's the first day of class. And I said, can I go with you? And she just, like, looked at me. I didn't know her. I, I never even met her before. And she goes, yeah, come come over and pick me up. We'll drive. And I so I went to Bible school. Fantastic. And I, that was, like, a really great experience because it really grounded me. So, Tony Pia is my guest. Tony Pia, P-I-A dot com is his website. So, kind of going with that for a moment, it seems like logic would say, and oftentimes life is not logical, you start going down the road of the Bible, and you got this music thing going on, it's like the two don't necessarily cross, mm. other than if you're going to be a worship guy. Mm. So... You went to Bible school. Did you ever in the back of your mind think, I don't know if I can keep doing this drumming thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I questioned that. I started going, I don't, maybe I'm not supposed to be doing it. And I, I went to, I, there was a college near my house. And uh, I, I went there to talk to um, like a, uh, oh, what, it, like, uh, oh, what are those guys called? Like, um, you know, guy, guys at college that help you like 
decide your career. Guidance counselor? Like a guidance counselor yep. kind of guy. And and I, I went to her, I had a meeting with him because I was like, you know, maybe I'm not supposed to do it. And I was talking to the guy, and like 30 minutes later, he just stops me and goes like, I I think you're supposed to be doing music. <laughs> and I went, really? He goes, yeah. And so I left there, and then, um, you know, and then it, it I don't know. It just started making sense. I, I I don't know. I just I just kind of like wasn't sure because, you know. I mean, the I saw the underbelly of the music industry and you know just how like wacky it can be and and I was thinking maybe I, maybe this is not right for me to be in a musician and a Christian, but then you know then that kind of started making more more and more sense to me and and you know the Lord doesn't want you to like. Okay, I'm a Christian now. I have to be a missionary. That's you know? right. Like you know, That's right. he wants you to like be be an influence, whatever profession you're in, or you know, in your sphere of influence. He wants you to to be there and stand for him, no matter what you're doing. If you're an accountant, a doctor, a lawyer, an astronaut, whatever, you, you know, just proclaim your faith. And that being said, there is still somewhat of a how shall we say this when it comes to the music industry. In certain circles, in the Christian faith, there are still some people that go, no, you can't do both. One of my good friends is Brian Head Welch from Corn. When he got saved, oh my goodness, he dropped out for a while, then he went back to Corn, and he still gets ridiculed all the time. How can you be in Corn and love the Lord? And he's like, look, are you going to preach the gospel to these kids that are desperate? He goes, this is where God's got me. Hmm. So... To me, that makes perfect sense, and I want to spend a few moments in that. So you go through these times, Bible school, do I still want to drum, kind of get the green lights. So was there a moment where, in lack of better terms, you got a big break? Because I know you've toured with some pretty big bands. Yeah. So, you know, while I was in Bible college, you know, the other thing, too, was that, um, you know, I saw the kind of music that christians were producing and i knew it was like pretty inferior and it, it was kind of sad you know because you know historically it was the church that kind of like paved the way for music yep. you know and, and now it's like the the opposite the opposite way but um i don't know i just kind of like i knew too much and i had too much experience playing music to like just throw that out throw that away i guess and so um i just kept kept um, pursuing that and then I I decided I I wanted to get better at at the whole music thing and uh, it's funny I, after I became a Christian I became really grounded and I I I appreciated everything more and I wanted to learn I I had this like uh, unquenchable desire to learn not just more more Bible stuff which is why I went to Bible school but I kind of realized you know what you should go to Back to music school because I went to music college and it was just like it, it just drove me crazy. You know, it was it was not what I thought. It was a lot of stuff that you know I, I'm just like writing stuff down and like memorizing stuff, but it's not making me better. It's not creative. It's not you know. It's just a bunch of like. Where's the application to yeah, actually yeah. doing it? Yeah, yeah, and it was just like memorizing stuff instead of like, you know, this is, I don't even want to learn this stuff, you know? Yeah. So I dropped out. But now, all of a sudden, I'm a Christian, and I thought, you know what, man, I'd, I'd really like to learn about music history and music theory, and like, so that that desire drove me to go to North Texas State University. Well, it was North Texas State University at the time. Now it's the University of North Texas, or Wait, the other way around. So I went there because great music school, and I had some friends that had gone there. Uh, my friend Greg Bissonette went there, and he was telling me, yeah, man, you should go there, man. It's a great school. And so I went there and did really well. I got in the 1 o'clock band. It's a really famous band. And, um, you know, I, I did extremely well there. And because of my context there, I you know, then things started opening up. I went on the road with Woody Herman Orchestra. And, um, you know, things started opening up. I started doing more really cool gigs and professional gigs and then the same thing happened like you know I, i'm there in dallas texas after i finished school and it's kind of like well you know this is as far as you're gonna go here bro you gotta do some and so my friend greg said you know you should come to you should come to la man there's a lot of stuff going here it's a great place a lot of work and 
And I was torn between either there or Nashville or New York. And well, I already tried New York, man. You know, it's like, okay. So I thought about Nashville, and I thought, you know what? L.A. makes more sense. So I, I came to L.A., and the first couple of years was, was brutal. I mean, I wasn't working. But one of the first gigs I had was playing at um, Calvary Chapel Church um, on the worship team. Um, down in, it was down in uh, San Juan Capistrano. And the pastor was Chuck Smith Jr. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And we got to play a couple times at Chuck Smith Sr.'s church in uh, Costa Mesa. Costa Mesa. And uh, so it was just, it was just like wild to me. You know, I'm like, I'm playing at Chuck Smith Sr.'s church that I, I used to listen to him on the radio like, right. when I was in Vegas. He's I, responsible for the oh Advent and, and Calvary chapels all over the world. I'm playing at Godspeak Calvary Chapel. Yep. You know, at, on the weekends here. Yeah, you are. And, um, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look back, like you were saying, you know, it's not it's not a coincidence. It's It didn't, you know, I don't believe in coincidences either. And, like, you know, yeah, God had his hand on my life, for sure. So, to be nuts and bolts, that's wonderful, and praise God and all that, and safe to say... Being in a worship band at a church isn't paying all the bills. No. Right. So, what happened? I imagine you reached a point where, do I go back to Detroit and you know work in the car industry, or what do I do to make money? And yet, I know you, you've toured with some people that I used to be acquainted with at KLOS, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I. I just couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. You know, I mean, I, it's just even my wife goes, you know, I, I talk to her sometimes. She goes, no, I can't imagine you like <laughs> working at Target or, you know, something. And, um, you know, I just I, I'm just one of these guys that um, I'm like a pit bull, man. I just, you know, dig in and I'm not going to quit. You know, that kind of, I just had that attitude. And I. I just, I don't know, maybe it's bad, you know, it's because it's, it's kind of like, uh, maybe I'm too dumb to quit, you know. But I had, like, great friends, and like my friend Greg Bissonette, you know, when I moved to L.A., he needed he needed a roommate, so I lived with him, and he was constantly like, hey, man, you should do this gig over here. I'm, hey, I recommended you for this. Hey, I'm going to recommend you for this gig. So he was constantly throwing things my way, and, you know, I... I, I kind of found out real quick that it's not it's not what you know it's who you know yep that kind of thing yep and uh you know greg got me like a really great gig playing with edgar winter you know and then i wound up going on the road with maynard ferguson and i did the edgar winter gig for a while um played with you know engelbert humperdinck played with uh the doobie brothers and um you know played a little bit with um uh, Peter Frampton, and uh, you know, I got to play some really cool gigs, and and did did a lot of cool work. So I don't know. It was always things were a little bit different, you know. Um, <clears throat> there was always work around, you know. There was always a gig somewhere, or somebody was always looking for a drummer, you know. And that was another thing too. Growing up was that there was just always work. Yeah. You know, there, I mean, everybody was looking for musicians. There were bands all over the place. And it's really changed a lot. That's not, that's not the case anymore. Yeah, music has, the industry yeah. has changed. Totally. Completely. Yeah. So it, you know, I mean, and then there comes a point too where you're just like, I, I can't do anything anyway because I'm just too old to like, what am I going to do? Like start over, you know, and I'm like 55 years old and I'm going to, what I'm going to change. Oh my that. gosh. You're so ancient, yeah. Tony. Yeah, yeah. You can't reinvent yourself at all. No, but you know what I mean? It's, I do. It comes to, there comes a point where you kind of like, yeah, it's like I, I'm in too deep. Yeah. You know, I can't, I can't, turn, what am I going to do? Yeah, I've been in radio 36 years and different incarnations. I'm yeah. like, ah, yeah, I think I'm going back in front of the microphone again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So here's a question uh, of a few that I have in mind. Um, so touring with some high-profile rock bands, making okay money, doing that whole thing, um, did you have this inclination to share your faith 
I mean, it, let me backtrack. So the non-believing world will watch this and go, okay, Tony's Christian, Sontag's Christian. They're just out there with Bible in hand, beating an old, you know, the Bible <laughs> over the head, and especially in the rock industry, you got to be saved. You got to, you know, all that stuff, all these right. preconceived notions that are just absolute lies. And some of us are motivated to really share. Um, there was a college basketball coach, John Wooden. He was uh, probably one of the greatest followers of Christ, but he kept his faith hmm. quiet, even though he was a coach. So you're up there drumming with the Doobie Brothers. Is it like, okay, we go to break and I'm going to share the Bible with the gang? Or <laughs> they look at you like Tony's the crazy Christian, the Jesus freak. I mean, how, how did those two worlds collide or did they? Um, sometimes they collided. Sometimes they didn't. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I wish I had, I, I wish I was the kind of guy that was more like vocal about it. I, I'm just kind of not like that. But, you know, there's, you, you kind of have to like pick your battles. I mean, you kind of have to know when to, when to speak and when not to. That's right. Because you, you find out pretty quick that, you know, if you make enemies, the door is going to be closed. You know, and if you say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time, the the doors are going to be closed. You know, so for me, I it was always kind of like I would just kind of like try to sneak in when I could. I would try to talk to people. You know, when I first became a Christian too, it was you know I was like really on fire and I did, I didn't care and I just like would would talk to anyone and. Um, but, but you, you kind of learn that like, you, you know, you, you kind of have to have a relationship with someone before you can kind of share with them. You can't just like meet a stranger and 10 seconds later, you're giving them the gospel. I mean, some people can do that. I, I I'm just not like that, you know, but, but I've always tried to share when it's appropriate, you know, and, and I've always tried to ch share my faith with anyone that, that I could, but you know a a lot of a lot of times the way the way the music business is you're just there to work i mean you 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 show up you do your thing and like everyone leaves and that's kind of like you know it's kind of like boom 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 you know there isn't like always time or room to share with people you know and sometimes you share with people and they they agree with you and then sometimes you share and they don't agree with you. And it's just gotten really weird lately, you know, because I, I think since COVID, it's, uh, it's a new world, you know, and um, you, you can be like demonetized and censored and like never work again if, if you say the wrong thing. Yep. To, you know, it wasn't that long ago, Frank Sontag, that you could be a Christian, a Buddhist, you know, whatever you were, you could be a Democrat or Republican. It didn't matter. You could, you could say what you were, and you know, all the guys would go out and hang out, and you know, you'd you'd have lunch together, have dinner, you know, go to movies together. But man, these days, it's um, it, if you say the wrong thing, you, you've crossed the line, and there's serious penalties, you know. But it's 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 weird, isn't it? That not that man, not that many years ago. It didn't matter, you know? Things have changed, and you mentioned lockdowns, <clears throat> excuse me, and COVID. Um, things have increased logarithmically, accelerated a great deal, where it was just figuratively yesterday where we agreed to disagree, we hung out, we knew, hey, your politics aren't mine, or your faith is not mine, and we're still cool. Now it's like, uh, this is a different world. Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So to put that there for a moment and go back to the world we lived in, not just a moment ago, where we kind of all got along, um, we have a mutual friend. I don't need to name drop. He's a high profile drummer too. He's not saved. You went to a Dodger game recently and we kind of had a good laugh about you guys hanging out together. But here's my point. That's great. Um, when the world looks to Christians, especially a Christian drummer, and I'm, I'm hitting bottom line here just to make the point, in a rock band, and I was at KLOS for 27 years. I got saved the last three years there. I was on the morning show with Mark and Brian, and people are like, you can't listen to rock music. 
<laughs> you you uh you have to you know they have all these these ideas of what it means to be a Christian and I'm like what are you talking about I still love listening to yeah. rock yeah. I mean you know the roots and the gospel and I could share stories this isn't the the the, the time but was there a time where you're I'm just hype hypothesizing here you're drumming with the doobies you're out on tour and that little voice in the enemy goes hey man you're christian you shouldn't be playing this music no i never good i never it that never was i know i know people like that that question it but it wasn't i no i didn't like it, you're you're leading people to hell back masking no. zeppelin you know listen to stairway and no. all this nonsense we get conjured up by and not to go long here but in this day and age of social media there are christian podcasts christian influencers that will sit there and rant and rave with their three hundred thousand followers about the dangers of rock and roll and back masking and it's satanic and i'm like <clears throat> you're a you're a you're an idiot well you know the the enemy will use anything he can to like throw people off. You know, the, the thing the thing about music is that you know that I always remember is that it's a really beautiful thing. I mean, God made it. God created it. And I mean, you can when when you hear like a really pretty melody and you hear nice chords and so it's really a be- music is a beautiful thing it's the enemy that's taken it and and destroyed it um you know i <laughs> more than ever to me god just makes more sense these days than ever before so the whole question about you know, music and like, you know, this is wrong and this is right. It's, you know, um, it's it's what whatever. I don't know how to say this, but it, God created something really beautiful. You know, and if you want to distort it and make it look weird and and say weird things about it, that's that's your deal. But you know, even even no matter who I was playing with, you know. It was still a beautiful thing to me, and and it was my job. You know, I never looked at it like I shouldn't be playing. The, you know, I'm getting paid. I need I need to make a living. That's right. You know, and, and not only that, but like I'm looking over here, and there's this nice big Apple screen over here. Like the guy that owns that company. <laughs> I mean, why is he any better than the Doobie Brothers and what they're what they're their music is all about or corn or any or anyone else you know the car i drive the guy that owns that company man he might be a pedophile for all i mean like we're all sinners you know i mean and i'm just i'm just a sinner saved by grace but you know if you want to take it to the nth degree and it's kind of weird how the enemy takes music of all things you know it's like it's just it's it's music but they try to like put it into a little box and stuff. And a lot of, like, look at, look at, well, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but look at the medical industry. Come on. Oh, my gosh, man. I, you got to be kidding me, man. I mean, like, if ever there was a time, you know, these people are butchering people, literally, you know, with the whole transgender stuff. It's like, how come that, how, how come you're not like putting restrictions on, on those guys? You know, why is it, why is music like, you know, oh, you can't play this and you can't do that. It's like, these other guys are doing stuff. They're, they're getting away with murder. Yeah. You know? So I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Tony P is my guest. Kind of a caveat. And then a few more questions. So I fell into the new age in the eighties had a show on KLOS for 21 years, spiritual but not religious, rebelling against God, the true God of the universe, not the God that I made up in my head. And um, so there was a time when, um, I guess Christianity has always taken the big hit worldwide, but there was a time when, as as you alluded to, faith, you know, you could, the the coexist bumper sticker was popular then. (laughs) I remember that. Right? Like all, and you still see some here and there. Yeah. Yeah. But I reached a point in my life where I saw glaring inconsistencies Mm -hmm. where I knew, 
hey, all the religions don't necessarily say all the other religions, you're good. Like just open up a Quran and read it and start studying a little bit the history of Muhammad. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think he was down with Christianity as it were, even though there's blurring of the lines. So all that to say this, and where am I going with all this? We live in times right now, you and I would agree, partially because of our faith and our understanding of the Bible. A lot has happened in just the last few years, oh, yeah. where whether it's the music industry, whether it's the globalists, and I don't want to get into uh, you know certain areas as it were, but the point is, we wake up today, the world's different, and you... God has placed a gift in you of other gifts to play music with the music industry tra- changing. You've alluded to you playing the worship band at the church um, we go to um, sometimes. Um, what, is the, what does the future look like now for Tony Pia as it applies to, you know, turning a buck and trying to provide? And I have no idea. I mean, and, and truth is, no one really knows. You know what I mean? I, and I don't care what industry you're you're in, y- you can't predict the future. No, no one knows that, you know. Um, but I have this faith in the Lord that, and He's always taking care of me, you know. So ultimately, He's in charge and He's in control. I I don't know all the particulars. Do I stress out about it? Yeah. Should I stress out about it? No. But you know, I I I'm, I got this stuff on my bones called skin, you know, and so I'm human and like, yeah, it worries me and stuff. I don't know what the future is. I like the the hat, White Rose Resistance, Seth Gruber. That's right. Awesome. Awesome guy. That dude, that dude is, oh. uh, you talk about a guy that's got the fire in him mm-hmm. and holds no punches back. And I got exposed to him by being at God Speak Church. He, he was, he I think he's moved, he's left California, but he was there all the time, and he's he's awesome. The church is great, by the way. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just trying to plug the church a little bit, just because Pastor Rob. I mean, he's he's amazing. During COVID, my church was closed, and I talked to my friend Mark, and uh, he goes, "Hey, you should come to our church." This is June, May of 2020. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm Mark. I'm going crazy. Like, I, you know, there's church. Church is closed. Because our church is open, and you don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> like what? <laughs> and I, I, he, he invited me, and I went, and I, I've been going ever since. But you know, um, I, I don't know. I don't know the future, but I know the one who knows the future. That's right. You know, and that's that's kind of that's kind of what I'm what I hang my hat on and what I cling to, and more so than ever because, you know, <laughs> the one thing that that COVID showed me is, you know, it, it kind of took the mask off of a lot of things. And for the first time, you know, I, I can't talk about this stuff without mentioning um, Eric Metaxas. Mm-hmm. And his new book mm-hmm. and the the documentary, it's, which I saw, it's letters to the church, letters to the American church, yep. brilliant. I want to talk about that a little bit. Yep. And and for the first time, we saw, you know, this this now this war that's going on in Israel. But for the first time, we saw an event take place that affected the entire globe. COVID. That's the first time. That I, I mean, in my memory, where the entire planet got affected by something. And that's just like, you know where you're going to go with that. You know, and you see everyone doing all this stuff with, you know, like try, trying to have like a digital currency and all that stuff. And you know what's coming. You know, Christ, Jesus told us about, you know, the end time. And, you know, and Revelation talks about, you know, the mark of the beast and the, what the one world, you know, system that's coming. And it's, it's like, wow, <laughs> it, it really is coming. You know, I don't know when, I don't know if I'm going to live long enough to see it, but it's, you, you know, you just look and you go, you know, the Bible's true. It, 
what it says is going to happen, it's going to happen. You can see kind of the events going that way. I hate to say to say it, but you can see the American empire is being taken out of the way. You know, and I, you know, I'm, I don't know for sure, but I'm just saying this is how it looks, that maybe God is taking America out of the way to set things up for Israel so that the Antichrist comes on the scene and gets, gets ready for his appearance and for him to install the mark of the beast. And for the first time, that, that, for that passage out of Revelation, and he will make all, all small or great, free or slave, rich or poor. That's every class of people that you can think of. And you can see it leading to that. I mean, if they pull this off with everybody, ha- I, I just talked to a friend of mine, John Snyder. He's a pastor in Germany. I think he's in Munich. And we just talked on the phone a couple weeks ago. He's a pastor there. And he's telling me, like in Europe, they're trying to do this digital yep. this digital banking thing. And I'm telling you, man, it's it's... Little incremental steps. Well, and you look at Trudeau in Canada. I don't want to get down this road too far, but that dude, I mean, yeah. it should be in prison yeah. for all the stuff he's done and trying to do. And so some people are watching going, wow, this interview took a turn. These Christians are talking about, <laughs> you know, the end and this low Christian fee-y. nationalism. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe any of this. And, and, but, but here's the deal. Mm-hmm. The one truth that is undeniable and inescapable is, as Jim Morrison used to say, none of us get out of here alive. Mm-hmm. So yep. what do we do with the time that we have? Short, long? We all know people that have um, tragically lost loved ones, maybe even mm-hmm. <clears throat> at birth. We'd love to live to be 150 or whatever, and but time's taken pretty quick here. So in the remaining moments we have, we can talk about Eric a little bit, but I want to I want to see if we can somehow not witness to people, but maybe to talk about our respective faiths, knowing that, and I I know the way I can set it up, knowing that he is in control. So here's a short story and then anywhere you want to go. So I got saved in 09. (laughs) Shortly thereafter in 2010, the national championship game was between Texas and I want to say Alabama and Colt McCoy was the quarterback for Texas. <laughs> I'm a sports guy. I just got saved. Not really sure who Jesus is or what's happening to my life. He got hurt in the first series of downs. <clears throat> I believe he was a senior. Worked his whole life for that moment to be in the national championship game. Thinks he's going to be a football player in the NFL. He gets hurt, somebody hits him, his arm goes dead, he can't even hold a ball. They lose the national championship game. He watches from the sidelines the whole game. After the game, I don't know who the interviewer was, but somebody sticks a mic in his face and asks that question, drives me nuts as a guy that's in the media, you know, like in essence, hey, how does it feel that you've worked your whole life and you couldn't play and your team loses and he's standing there with tears in his eyes. He was talking to me as a new Christian. Hmm. He said, hey, I can't explain any of this. He said, I I would have done anything to be out there. He said, but I know who my rock is. Hmm. Yep. And he said, his plan, his ways are not my ways. I'm getting emotional because it rocked me. Because I started to doubt my faith a little bit. Being a Christian is not for weak people. I used to think, mm-hmm. you know, those that follow God, you're just stupid and weak and, you know, all that. And boy, God showed me who he was and is. But listening to Colt witness in that way, it was undeniable that what he was saying was absolutely the truth. And I remember thinking, I want what he's got mm-hmm. when he talks about that rock. No matter what happens, I'm all in. Fast forward now, 15 years, world's getting a little funky. You and I are brothers in Christ and love music and and a lot of other things uh, together. And yet we're looking at the way things look when we wake up and we're like, man, this is kind of dicey right now. Mm -hmm. 
And yet, we know who our rock is. Mm -hmm. And there are people watching right now that don't know. Yeah. So my response, I, I understand what you're saying, and my response is this, you know, you're going to die someday. It's inevitable. You're going to die someday. You're going to take your last breath, and you're going to die. And where you go is up to you. And now is the time to, de to decide, to make that decision. Um, it's, a, it's, an eternal, <laughs> it's an eternal destination. And you don't want to pick the wrong one. But you are going to die someday. You, you will die. Everybody does. And, you know, when I said earlier, I, ha I kept hearing that voice, yeah. you know, like, I'm the author of life. Yeah. This is life. That's right. You know, it's not just like a baby being born. God is in control of all of this thing. You know, why did that happen to, to him? Well, let me ask you a question, Frank. Why did God let you live? I mean, he, he he could have been born and been stillborn. You could have you could have been born and like two weeks later you died suddenly in the crib. You didn't God didn't have to let you live. He's not obligated to let you live. And you may not know this in eighty four, not far from here, I was run down on the freeway by somebody doing hundred and ten. I had no helmet on. And there's no way, no way I should have walked away. And yet I still didn't go to him. I still rebelled against him. Frank, <laughs> maybe in eternity we'll have a chance to, to go over this, but I shouldn't be here right now. I mean, I, I, I should have died a thousand times, you know, and it was only God keeping me alive. It was only, you know, maybe my guardian angel, like, stepped in and intervened a, a bunch of times. But I know it's God's plan. I know that God said, no. You're gonna you're gonna do this and you're gonna accomplish that and I have this plan for you, you know because um, you know God God's not obligated to let me be successful. He's not obligated to let me live. He's not obligated to to do anything for me. I mean, like he could have said, you know what? I think when you turn 27, I'm gonna have you in a car accident. You're gonna die. My my brother passed away like 11 years ago and he was younger than me and I kept making like gestures to God look my brother's married he's got two kids why don't you take me instead I, you know I don't have any kids and just, uh, it's like no it doesn't work that way you can't barter you can't barter with God why did he do that I I don't know I mean it, I, it didn't make sense to me but I trust him you know because I I am gonna die one day Unless I get raptured, and it looks closer, like more and more like that could happen, yeah. but I am going to die one day. And you know what? Here's here's what I what comes back to me. Let's say I live to be two hundred years old. Mm. What is that going to mean ten thousand years from now? That's right. Nothing. It's it's it doesn't. Nobody's going to remember you anyway. No, no exactly. Yeah. And and like it, in the grand scheme of things, it's not. I mean, you could be. Whoever, Mick, Mick Jagger, the president of the United States, you know, somebody like super famous, who's, no one's going to remember that a thousand years, 10,000 years from now. You could have, you know, everything and it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. So um, picking up on that, you had alluded to a lot of this doesn't make sense the way things happen in life. Here's where I want to kind of start wrapping up and anything else you want to share. What does make sense to those of us that have a relationship with him, there are moments that are undeniable where you know it's him and not me mm. that's guiding your life. And that's something that is so hard to tangibly express to people. I, I, I never really had somebody witness to me in my new age days per se, and I rebelled against God. And if I would have saw this back when I was a new age guru, I'm like, oh, these Christian whack jobs, these Jesus freaks, sorry, not buying it. But when you do give your life to him and you start seeing everything connected, that's the part, maybe this world doesn't make sense, 
but from, if you will, a spiritual lens, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. And and Jesus said, I will make all things new. The new life we have and the way we see, oh, I don't know, I, I, I'd like to think I was kind of a kind guy back then, but now the levels of compassion that the Holy Spirit leads me in or tells me to do this and we have free will, but that's when life really gets vibrant. Hmm. When you have him as your Lord and Savior by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I have a men's ministry when we start touch start teaching men that Father God loves us as his son, because so many guys have father wounds, mm. they know their dads, they struggle with the whole father thing. I mean, look at culture. We've accepted now fatherlessness as normal, where kids are growing up without a dad. Yeah. So that to say this, you know, I, I don't know what I would do, Tony. I, I, I probably wouldn't be here. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have faith in Christ. I don't know how I could even navigate one moment, let alone a day, in the world the way it is. Oh, I, yeah. The same with me. I, I would be in a rubber room. I mean, they, I, I'd be in a straight jacket. I, I, uh, the whole, you know, Jesus and what he did for me, sa- saving me, the, the gospel message, who God is, having a personal relationship with him, it just... It, it's the glue that makes everything hold together. It's what makes, for me, it's what makes the universe make sense. You know, um, it just answers a lot of questions. You know, be, before I became saved, I like looked into like you know Buz, Buddhism and you know um, different philosophies and different religions and stuff, and nothing, nothing really. Nothing answered those questions. Nothing made sense. Um, and when when I did get when I did get saved, all the que- I had questions answered that I didn't even have questions for originally. Right. You know, so right. it just everything just made made sense about the universe and about humanity, how we treat each other. Um, my, I just want to make sure that that I in the end I hear well done faithful servant Amen. you know enter enter the kingdom I just I just want to make sure that I hear those words you know and I, a lot of times I've made Jesus my savior but not always my lord you know I I keep wanting to put those boots on that are like these are this is me you know yeah. I can do this myself and I you know I can't um, but that's that, you know, the, the other thing I was going to mention was, uh, Eric Metaxas, you know, and, and that, that the, the book and the, the documentary that he did. And, uh, I went, you know, he came and spoke at, at our, at the church, uh, at Godspeed church. And, um, I saw him interviewed by Jordan Peterson about that book and it was a great interview. And um, we're we're living in really dark times, I, and I don't care, you know. You're a Republican, a dem- Democrat, conservative, lib- whatever you are, you know, atheist, Christian. I think most people, most people that I talk to, when you <laughs> when you're like one on one, they know things are messed up. I I, I don't care who you are. I mean. You kind of got to know that things are messed up. You know, it's not. This is not. I I know people that grew up in this country. They've never read, you know, the Constitution or Declaration of Independence. And they know what freedom is because they grew up here. But they know something's not right. You know, and we're living in, in some weird times, weird times. And there's... More and more, I see darkness around, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm so thankful that my Lord has the light, you know, and cuts through that stuff because um, I feel really bad for people that are not Christians because I, in my mind, I just go, man, how do you navigate through all this craziness? How do you get up in the morning and not want to? You know, pick up a revolver and put it in your mouth. I mean, like, I, 
substance, addictions, depression, all that stuff. Man, I, yeah, not to mention all the other wackiness and the, the you know, incredible amounts of you know, corruption and deceit, you know. That's the biggest thing I, that, that I see is the deceit and the lying. It's just a constant barrage of like, I'm going to lie to you right now, right to your face and, and convince you that all my lies are true. I mean, I've just never seen, seen it on this level. Yeah, and and I, I know who's driving that. Yep, it ain't, and it's it's not my Lord Jesus doing nope. that. Nope, you know. So it's a weird, it's a weird time. It's a dark time. I don't know the future, but I know everyone that's watching this. You are gonna die someday. Just a fact. Yeah. Book your reservation. Yep. You know. Not to simplify that message, but I, I, you know, I like movies and some some lines in movies that stand out. I mean, I'm not going to go long here because we got to wind up. But in Braveheart, when Mel Gibson got in front of the troops and basically said, you know, we're all going to die, but how are you going to live? Mm. You know, I love Fran Francis Schaeffer. Yeah. You know, I think he he wrote this one book called How Should We Then Live? Yeah. You know? That's that's kind of like the essence of of scripture. That's God's essence. I mean, it's not you know about how you're going to die. It's about how you're going to live. Jesus came here to give us life. You know, God gave us the Bible to show us how to live. You know, because he cared that much about humanity. You know, that's what it's all about. God is showing us how to live. If you want to know, you know, if you want to embrace and accept that message, he came here to give us life and because he loves humanity that much. That's right. And that's the thing to me. It just... Um, it just all makes sense. You know, none of this stuff that's going on, if I wasn't a believer, it just wouldn't make sense to me. It still doesn't make sense, but it makes sense in the fact, in, in, the way, in a way that um, you, you understand God's plan. You, you know where the faults are. He's, he's told us all this stuff in advance because he loves us that much because he loves humanity. He's warned us. He's given, I mean, his book is the owner's manual. He's telling us like, hey guys, here's how you should live. Here's how you should treat each other. This is wrong. Don't, don't behave this way. Don't do that. Here's how I want you to treat me. And by the way, here's what's going to happen in the end. Just a, like a little sneak preview. I'm not going to give you all the details, right. but here's what you can look look to, and just don't worry about it. Stick with me. I'll get us. I'll get you through it because I love you, and I I care about you. I mean, who? I couldn't find that anywhere else. If you find that somewhere else, Frank, let me know. I will. I will end with this, and this is nothing other than what you just shared. Um. There are people watching right now, they think of faith, they think of church and priests or pastors are like, I don't want any of that. It's too dogmatic. What you just shared, that sermon will preach. Hmm. Because what you just said was as true and as simple and as forthright as anybody watching this, if you just want to open your heart and just ponder for a moment what you just said. Hmm. It's all there. And my hope and prayer is, Maybe one person will reach out to you, reach out to me. TonyPia.com is his website. Reach out to me and just go, I got questions. Can we have a conversation? You know, I, 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 I'm at a point in my life where I, I want to start talking about God and who is this Jesus? Yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> this was weird. Just yesterday, I was thinking, who will I see in heaven? Oh, boy. You know, have you ever done it? Oh, like, yeah. Uh, I don't think I'll see this guy. I doubt she'll be there, but I think I'm going to see this guy. And like, 
it, you know, there's an old uh, Duke Ellington thing. He did Duke Ellington, I believe, was a was a Christian, and he he did these sacred concerts. And there was this one piece he did, and it was called "Will You Be There?" Mm. And that's that's to to me that's another thing of like where where are you going when when this is over where where are you going who's offering you anything who's who's telling you what to expect who's who's is but is buddhism and hinduism is that is that answering questions for you is that giving you peace and comfort is that giving you joy is that reassuring you that when you take your last breath you know where you're going that you're going to be with with people that you know and love, and you're going to be in a in a state of happiness and bliss with a God that knows you and created you, or are you just like going into nothingness? Why, why would you want that? I mean, why wouldn't you want, you know, a, a really wonderful thing? Because, like I said, we're all we're all going to take that last breath at yeah. some point. Yeah, you know. So, anyway. Tony, it was a blessing to have you on the podcast. Um, we're just kind of scratching the surface. Lord willing, I'm going to do this for quite a while. If it's if it's my say, I want to do this for a long time. Would love to have you back. I hope so. I um, hope you do it a long time, Frank. And I'd love to come back anytime, man. Any brother. anytime. And you know, we'll be praying for you. And you know, I know it's it's a it's a day by day thing. Yep. You know, I mean. You don't know what your future is going to be doing this. I don't know what what my future is going to be either. But you know, but we we're both locked into the same God that knows the future for me, for you, for everyone. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, and that God said, "This is the day that I made. May we be joyous in it." Absolutely, man. Tomorrow, so much joy and peace to you, brother. I love you. I love you too, man. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm really glad that you asked me to do this and um, wish you a lot of luck and success with this, with Thank the you. podcast, man. It's, Thank you. It's really great. And I will see you at church. Yep, you will. <laughs> and I will see you next time for the Frank Sontag podcast. You can find us at usually all the um, social media outlets. We're primarily on YouTube. You can follow me on Instagram. And until next time, I'll speak for Tony and myself. May God bless you deeply. If you do not know who Jesus is, my hope and prayer is that maybe something got triggered. If you have questions, don't deny it. Don't wait till tomorrow because tomorrow's not guaranteed. This is the day the Lord has made. And uh, I'm here, Tony's here, and Jesus is here right now waiting on you. He's knocking at your door. God bless you. This is the Frank Sontag Podcast.